We want to make sure that we can get you guys as much information as possible during this hour and you have as much time with our panelists as possible. So let's go ahead and get things started. So my name is Latoya Walters. I'm one of the admissions and recruitment managers here at the School of Education. Um, I would like to thank our panelists that are here today, that are here to be able to provide some information for you guys today. Um, I'd first like to introduce our moderator. So Marcy Johnson um, has been working for the University of Pittsburgh since 2014, working a lot within alumni relations and currently the director of special projects over in the School of Public Health. She also just recently graduated from our master's in higher education program in December. We just got to see her diploma on the wall. So thank you again, Marcy, for being our moderator today. <laughs> Of course, and thank you. I can't go. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't give Latoya. She was my in my cohort, so we graduated together. The Latoya also graduated. I'm very excited to be here. And like Latoya said, I've been at the University of Pittsburgh for the past almost 10 years. Um, a big chunk being in alumni relations, um, and more recently being on the academic side in the School of Public Health, which has been really exciting. Um, but we are going to I'm going to have all the panelists introduce themselves. Um, so AC, do you want to go first? You're first on my screen. Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alan Williams. I use pronouns he, him, his. Uh, I go by AC because I'm so chill. I graduated from the Masters of Higher Education program in 2020, and I'm currently the Assistant Director for Retention Initiatives in the Intercultural Diversity Center at the University of Buffalo. And it's a long way to say I work with diverse students and try to help them um, stay at the university um, in whatever ways we can retain them. Super excited to be here with you all today. Awesome. Doug? Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Stouch, um, class of 2017 from the Pitts uh, Higher Education Management Program. Um, just after I graduated, I actually went across the street to Carnegie Mellon, where I am the uh, currently the associate director for early engagement and assessment uh, with career services. Um, uh, also, kind of a, a long name, which is a thing in higher education. Uh, basically, uh, I, I focus on uh, early engagement programming, so first and second year career development, um, as well as assessment and reporting our outcomes for our office. So uh, a little bit of a data geek as well. Excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks. Jamie? You're on mute. Mute. Sorry. <laughs> no, I still have you. Let's see if I can. Yeah. Oh, there you go. But we're okay. Lost. Yep. Hi, so I'll try again. No worries. <laughs> we love technology. Uh, my name is Cheney Francis. Uh, I am currently the racial and ethnic disparities coordinator for Allegheny County Juvenile Court and Probation. Uh, I graduated from Pitt with my degree in education policy in 2022, which seems like a lifetime ago. Um, but a lot of what I currently do uh, is still related to education in a way. I'm teaching people a lot about racial and ethnic disparities as it in is it um, impacting the juvenile justice system? Um, I do a lot of data tracking, collection, analysis to make policy and procedure recommendations is a big chunk of what I do. Awesome, and Rose. Hello, everyone. It is very exciting to be here today. My name is Rose Roberts. I use she, her, and hers pronouns, and I am Assistant Director of Residence Life at Ursinus College in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. I graduated um, from Pitt with my from the Higher Education Management Program in uh, spring of 2020. I've been at our sinus ever since. I primarily work with first year students, um, everything from their initial housing placement and roommate matching through building a residential curriculum for them. Um, I also serve on staff assembly here at our sinus. We're currently going through a large um, restructuring and um, new management. So being a part of that has been really exciting. Um, and I also serve on our crisis response team and live on campus. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's just dive right in and I'm going to let, you know, whoever wants um, to jump in first, but would you mind sharing um, why you chose the School of Education and why the higher education track? happy um, to start. So I am from Pennsylvania originally. I grew up in the Lehigh Valley, um, Allentown area. And 
I was really excited at the prospects of being able to stay in state for me personally, but get a very different experience, which the furthest away I could get from the eastern side of Pennsylvania is Western PA. Um, and the School of Education really excited me. Honestly, I felt very welcomed even doing introductory visits there. Um, but for me, it was, I'm always somebody who had done a lot of internships when I was in undergrad, had taken a lot of kind of hands-on experience. And so a really strong focus on practicum work and being able to um, get tie into placements. You know, I got experience at Pitt, but I also got experience at Carnegie Mellon. I was able to do some work with Carlo University. So I just found it really amazing to get to learn about a lot of different types of higher education, being that higher education was what I was so passionate about and what I wanted to focus in professionally. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. And um, I'm originally from Gettysburg and, and moved to Pittsburgh in 2010 for my undergrad at, at Pitt um, and fell in love with Pittsburgh. Honestly, I really, really like it here. Um, but after I graduated, I worked as a little bit for uh, or a little bit as a social worker for um, children with cognitive um, differences and kind of decided that I, I had a passion for the college experience uh, as well as learning and development. So it felt like higher education was the right program. Plus, um, I felt being in Pittsburgh at Pitt, where I already had some connections, but also in a city where um, there are a lot of institutions around, right? So there were a lot of opportunities to have different types of experiences while um, getting my degree. So I know that there's there's some other uh, colleges not too far from here that have good higher ed programs, but being in the middle of Pittsburgh was was important to me. Um, and it really worked out because uh, of, of all the connections that I made and didn't have to go too far. So I'm still here. Yeah, I'm going to hop in as well. So I am a transplant. I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. So Pittsburgh was quite the stretch. Um, but what really cemented my interest in the University of Pittsburgh, which I was already interested, but I just grew to love it in a different way, was I participated in a global um, leadership fellowship, the Hesselbahn Academy. Um, and so that really made me exposed to all of the opportunities in the region, but also at the university. And, and um, similar to Rose, from that very moment, the support that I received once I started to inquire more about the higher ed program was just pretty um, transformative and consistent to, throughout my experience being with the school. Um, but what really kind of um, cemented it was the internship opportunities, but also the flexibility and being able to kind of modify the curriculum to to uh, meet the needs that you had or the passions and interests that you wanted to explore. And so that's what kind of um, had me so. Um, I'll finish it up. Uh, as the true Yinzer here, I'll call myself. I am born and raised in Pittsburgh, so I was always familiar with Pitt. Um, it was always known as, you know, it, it's Pitt, it's a big school. It's like the best school that you could go to. Um, and very quickly after I graduated and from undergrad in 2020, I pivoted right, you know, I think a lot of us from the pandemic was just like, ah, grad school, why not? Um, so I did that, and I actually started in the Social Comparative Analysis and Education, SCAE program. That is now what we call the Ed Policy Program. And and um, similarly to AC, I think I'll piggyback off of that was like, the program was very flexible. I was taking classes that I was really interested in. Um, I'm really focused in on girls' education, more specifically. Um, it is a little bit of what I do now, uh, but that was the big selling point for me with Pitt. There was a lot of flexibility and there were themes that I knew that I could engage with and that I had the support from faculty who specialized in those themes. Fantastic. Um, going along with some more questions that we received prior to, um, is there something you wish you would have known before entering the program? If so, what it is and why? Yeah, so I'm going to jump in on this one. I would probably say I wish, and I would say a portion of this is on me, right? I think that there are so many various pathways that you could explore with a degree, a master's degree in higher education. Um, and I think the program is primarily geared towards the student affairs tracks. At least my cohort was mostly all student affairs. There weren't a lot of management um, folks in it. And so as someone who wanted to, um, you know, pursue a doctorate degree, I think that I could have just had a little bit more continuity between my master's program and my doctoral research. So, cause like when I entered my PhD program a year later, it just kind of felt to a degree that I was like trying to make the connections when there was a clear 
um, there was a clear pathway between the two. Um, and so I just wish that there would have been more um, research opportunities that I could have pursued um, and things of that nature. And while I, I think have again. you, oh, sorry. Just no, go, please, Marcy. A question specifically for AC. Um, can you elaborate, just because you were just talking about it a little bit, about the fellowship opportunity that you were involved in? The person said it sounds really interesting. Oh, yeah. So um, basically, the Help Hesselbein Global Leadership Academy is housed through, it's a leadership forum now to a degree, right? But what it does is it, it takes uh, global leaders from across the entire kind of world um, in a weekend immersive learning experience. And so we got to engage in um, dialogue about what leadership means, right? Um, about the history and the legacy of Francis Hesselbein. Um, and then about various ways that we plan to engage. Um, and so I can drop in the chat um, in just a second the, the web page, um, the PIT web page on how to apply. Oh, looks like somebody got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to talk more about that offline if you would like as well. Awesome. Sorry. Back to you, Cheney. No, please don't apologize. Um, I think for me, I would have emphasized um, being more intentional about getting research experience in undergrad. And I say that as someone who came from a small state school here in Pennsylvania, I went to IUP, if anyone's familiar with IUP from PA. And I loved my experience. I got a whole lot out of it. It's just, I think transitioning from a small state school to a R1 university, you know, that's world renowned for research. Um, it was a little intimidating starting my program, um, being around my peers who've had extensive research um, experience, but thankfully I got that at Pitt, right? So it was very easy to talk to my advisor, talk to other faculty in my department and be like, hey, can I jump in on anything with you? And they were like, absolutely. We want you to. I want you to have this experience. I'll, I'll jump in. I think, um, you know, I, I wish I had known a little bit more about some of the niche roles um, in higher education and, and student affairs. Um, and and I'm, I'm thinking specifically mine where, it, you know, it's a little bit more in the assessment than the advising and counseling. And so when I um, when I came to higher ed, I, I, I thought about just academic advising, right? And maybe re residence life as well. Um, and didn't realize the the full scope. Of course, this is something that you know, I learned in the program, it's part of the program, um, but just it would have would have helped for a little bit more direction uh, to get the most out of the program too, to make sure that uh, I'm focusing on the right topics for papers or for for research um, when that I'm that I'm picking the right work to the internship or the assistantship. Um, so just doing that little bit of uh, research and maybe asking, you know, if you're if you're currently an undergrad student um, or uh, in, in college, uh, asking your advisors and, and just uh, being more mindful of what people in, in, in the administration of, of an institution are actually are actually doing. I, I feel like a lot of students don't know exactly what I do, but they do benefit from it. Doug, I just wanted to say I really appreciate you saying that because I was actually sitting here and that's definitely, you know, I, I was a first generation college student and I did not realize how, you know, okay, I got a handle on my undergraduate experience and then grad school is kind of that whole different beast when you don't have that. Um, and for me, I was going from a liberal arts college. I wanted this very different experience, but I didn't even know what that meant. Um, and so for me, the things that I actually struggle with were simply just knowing the abundance of resources. I, I you know, when you go to a school that maybe like right one career center is, is for everybody, I'd have really, it took me really that year to understand while well, the school of education's like trying to help me, there are these like greater pit resources for grad students, greater resources across, of course, the whole campus. Um, but really, it, it took me that little bit of trying to understand what some of that help close by felt like kind of the purpose of that, you know, um, I appreciate you bringing that up because I know that was actually where transparently I know I struggled and I did not even think about before going to grad school, like learning how to grad school is kind of its own beast when, you know, especially coming from a very different type of college. I was so thankful for my experience, but didn't even realize I didn't even think of the opportunities that would be open when you went to a school that just didn't have as many opportunities, to be honest. And going off of the chat, how was the transition after the program into finding work that reflected, you know, 
what you're interested in your study I think I'll take a stab at this and say like it started off on a on a high right <laughs> like there were so many opportunities I was a part of the inaugural cohort of the TPE Academy and then just the course curriculum specifically the seminar course really just helped us um, get prepared um, from our application materials to um, job talks and then the pandemic happened so that kind of just threw a wrench into things for me and so um, it was very Luckily, I was able to find gainful employment, but a lot of um, searches happened, um, and then that transition was just a little bit, um, it was exciting because it allowed me to be more reflective and intentional in my pursuit, but it was longer than anticipated. And so I think I started my first job post-grad, um, maybe July 1st or whatever the Monday was of the first week of July, so yeah. Uh, for me personally, the transition into the workforce was rough, to say the least. Uh, and this is a critique about the workforce and hiring practice, right? This is not about specifically uh, the skills that I had at Pitt, right? Um, my the hardest part for me was I've had a lot. I had a lot of companies tell me, "Oh, you look great on paper. You don't have any experience, right?" And the hard part of that is I have all this academic experience. I have the research backgrounds. I have all this stuff, and it's just not. Um, you know, the longevity of it was the hardest part to battle out. I think um, I'm still very grateful to have the job that I have. It was what I call a happy accident. Um, the job found me and I love what I do. I'm very happy to be here, but it was definitely, you know, kind of a backdoor situation. Um, but other than that, the transition, thankfully still for me, I graduated in May. I was hired in September of 2022. Um, so it was still only a couple months really, but it was a little wonky, a little wonky. Yeah, I'll share that um, I had been applying um, for what is still not actually my current position before the pandemic had started in 2020. And so um, in that time, it was very nerve wracking. Like when you I think of the, you know, just like, hey, our job freeze is going to happen, like are things even going to push forward. And so I've always been very grateful that that was the path that it, it had led me. But um I also like your honesty absolutely about just, you know, uh, the concerns with hiring are honestly things higher ed needs to reckon as a whole. I think a lot about, you know, what is the next, um, what is it like for the next people coming in and making sure that people, you know, entering the field are able to sustain and the fact that, you know, once you're in these positions and being able to say and advocate for better hiring practices, better work, you know, being transparent in salaries, being transparent and just the fact that sometimes things take long and it's, it's, uh, we know now that it's nothing to do with the candidate, but when you are the candidate, it feels so personal and um, you know, th those are really the things that I think continue to be the struggle and the struggle I see with new people coming into the field or when people go to switch. And so, um, you know, especially when I'm like, I know I was graduating at a very specific point in time, but also it's not like those things have really changed even in the last couple of years. We know it was like that prior to that. Um, and so the practices in higher ed are, can be frustrating, but they were also very transparent with me um, in my program about what that could look like, what that could feel, that transparency from professors, but that transparency also from um, my colleagues who I was working with, my cohort mates, um, some folks who were already working um, and were part-time in the program, other people who maybe had gone right out of undergrad and were going into that first professional, you know, being able to just be transparent with another and, and rely on one another, particularly at that point in time, but now being able to see um, people, AC and I were in the same program at the same time. And so being able to see people who, even when things um, were very like pandemic heavy, but have made their way back into higher ed and friends I have who found their way in and out, that I think speaks volumes to like the experience that you get. Because even when it's been very tumultuous points, knowing that people in this program have continued to come back into the higher ed sector, I think actually speaks to the fact that these are really passionate people who want to make a difference and the school puts resources to make you a viable candidate whenever you decide um, to go for it. Or like in your case, Cheyenne, like right going in and out, finding a position that you might not have even known is there that ends up being a good fit and uses those skills. Yeah, I'll just say um, I, I thought about all the folks looking for for work through the pandemic, especially those graduating. I couldn't I couldn't imagine um, um, you know what what that must have been like looking for a job at that time. I was I was fortunate in my job search. 
uh, 2017. Um, again, I knew I knew kind of I didn't know exactly what role I wanted or and I was open to multiple roles, but I knew Pittsburgh was the place. And so it was just looking at Carnegie Mellon. It was looking at Pitt. It was looking at Carlo, Duquesne, um, all the institutions around here to see what 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 sort of entry level positions were there. Um, another key aspect, too, was, you know, in this program, I was able to um, you know, make a lot of acquaintances, a lot of friends, right? And, and that network proved to be really helpful so that when I applied here at Carnegie Mellon um, at Career Services, I already knew a student from the cohort before me that had worked here in their internship but was able to connect me to the hiring manager so that I could get a conversation with them before um, joining in. So uh, it went pretty smoothly. I was hired in, in July after graduating um, and, and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a very high up role. It was certainly entry level and the salary certainly reflected that. But luckily, um, you know, staying dedicated and putting in uh, time and exploring my own interests and gaining skills has has led to um, higher positions down down the road. Otherwise, I might still be sort of looking around at, at what's out there. But uh, I, I've been very happy uh, to um, to work my way up a little bit um, here. Awesome. Um, going back to a couple questions that have been submitted, um, were any of you employed full or part-time while enrolled in the program? How was managing school, work, and internship? I've always worked while attending school. However, I've never had the added aspect of internship, and she, they would love to hear any tips. I'm going to kick it off because, um, just answer me, okay, um, I worked full time at the University of Pittsburgh and doing the pro I did the program part time so it took me three years versus the full time folks where it takes two years. And that was probably my biggest hesitation of how I was going to balance work, school, social life, you know, family and responsibilities outside of all of the hosts that we have all the time. And the pandemic I started in the spring of 2021. And, um, or 20, yeah, 2021. And um, I think it's just being really transparent. And also the faculty within the School of Ed were very um, supportive and understanding that we were working full-time, that we had other responsibilities, not only just the part-time folks, but the full-time folks as well. And I think they've also taken a couple of our suggestions of the internship. So I know when I started, it was, I forget the hours, um, a couple hours, and they had talked to us, the part-time folks, and they said, if you had X amount of experiences, you would be waived and you do like half of the internship hours. So I think it's just really being transparent and being really on top of the time management of it all and knowing that the reward at the end is the degree and the experience, and it's only going to continue to grow for you as well. Um, so that's my personal experience. I don't know. I think you were all full-time or were any of you part-time? All full-time? So I jokingly say I had a part-time job with full-time hours. So to just transition to answering the question, um, a full transparency, I had the privilege of working for my mother. She's a small business owner. And so while that was considered a full-time, a part-time position, I was working the typical full-time hours of like 40, sometimes closer to 60 hours a week um, as a caregiver, right? And balancing, trying to sit there, trying to take care of somebody or help them. And I'm typing a paper all the while, right? Um, but I think, again, thankfully, like what Marcy said, it was, I had so much support from peers, from faculty. Um, most of the peers in my cohort were parents, right? So they had a whole human being, if not more human beings to look after, like that is their first priority. And just thankfully having the flexibility to be like, hey, if you can come to class, great. If not, not a big deal. Someone will pass you the notes. I'll have it recorded on Zoom. I'll send you the lecture later. Um, and really just working together. We had a lot of um, group-based assignments, which I think definitely lessened the load. And then if you're someone like me who struggles with kind of team activities, it was a great learning curve, right? Um, trying to increase the skills of working with other folks um, when there's so many different perspectives and experiences brought to the table. Awesome. Okay. And then we got another one. Would you say that the School of Education graduate programs lend themselves more towards higher education work? Hey, 
in my experience um, with still talking and keeping in communication with my peers, I would say yes, um, that it seems like a lot of degrees are geared more towards folks who um, eventually want to work in a university setting, a college setting, um, in human resources specifically, in higher ed specifically. Um, and I've also seen a lot of people in nonprofits. Um, however, that's not to say that the program or degree that you have is not translatable in other fields, right? I'm a prime example. I would have never thought that I would land here, but essentially what I do is I'm teaching people and the things that I teach them, I want to be, I want those things to be put in policy so that the learning continues to grow, right? It's just not the traditional sense or understanding of what education policy is, but um, here we are. <laughs> Any, oh, I would just, so I was just going to jump in and I would say most of, you know, the people that I stay connected with um, after we graduated right now are still in higher ed. I have seen a couple of um, my classmates like, uh, you know, go to the, the nonprofit sector and there's all kinds of different things that you can do in the nonprofit sector. But um, I will say the majority of folks that I know are still um, in, a, in a position in, in higher education um, and, and have moved around as well, haven't stayed in the same position. Um, so I could say anecdotally that, yeah, it is geared toward higher ed positions. All right. Um, another question was, what did you learn in your program, soft or hard skills, um, that you believe are helpful in your current role? For me, it's definitely, and it's kind of started with uh, my alumni relations work and realizing, um, Doug kind of said it, like networking and making sure staying connected. Um, and that proved itself within the program as well to stay connected with your cohort um, and your professors and your faculty and your advisor. It just helps you in the long run. And they're there to want, you know, they want to have you fulfill the potential, your potential to and grow and be successful. So um, I think that's the biggest one is just honing in on the networking and making sure that you're um, taking the time to work towards creating those relationships. I um, definitely, when I think of things learned in classroom and the classes that probably I continue to reflect the most on and use um, in my work, um, I took social justice with Gina Garcia when she was um, within the School of Education. I mean, without a doubt, just like the amount of wealth and knowledge that I felt like learning under her was such a, an opportunity of wealth um, and to just get so much perspective that I would not have had an opportunity, especially again, like one of the big benefits of like going to pay, going to a place like Pittsburgh, being able to work with like really great faculty that just have perspective that I just would not have been privy to in, in another situation. Um, with that, I, um, it's funny because sometimes I'll look at the moments that I'm like, you know, when I was in the classroom and really um, kind of doing, doing work and being like, you know, where, what the day-to-day -day feels like versus when you're pulling this in. And I find that a lot of the work that I continue to do now, especially when I'm doing more like long-term project work, residential curriculum work, looking in, doing retention-based work, um, I have a lot greater appreciation for the student development theory that was learned for um, actually, you know, some of like the more theoretical things, right? I went into it because I appreciated the practicum side of it, being able to talk about my internship, and I came out having a much greater understanding in the value of doing some of the, the theoretical based work and research practices. Um, I think st um, the thing that continues to benefit me is just like that networking, that ability to keep rapport with with folks. I, I just got a text from like somebody in my cohort this morning who is a director of residence life and just having the ability to be like, you know, it can be really intense. It can be really odd sometimes the, the situations that we navigate and run into. Um, and, you know, they talk a lot about it, like, you know, student affairs is a smaller field than um, you realize, right? And you know one person and they have a connection and they know somebody. And so being able to just navigate 
both how you use that to benefit yourself in networking and also how you navigate just the realistic side of it, sort of the office politics side. Having those open and honest conversations um, are the things that were most helpful to me when I was a grad student experiencing that for the first time and continues to be helpful for me as I'm going on you know, four years post-grad school in the same position, um, but have continued to find ways to elevate and grow in my role, um, which is part of the reason I've been really happy where I am because I've been able to take on different things and new leadership things and still able to say like, I didn't even think that was going to like help me back when I learned that in grad school or like talked about this conversation with somebody like AC and like, oh, look at that. Here we are again. I think adding to what Rose just shared, so definitely um, being able to put theory into practice was like something that they trained and in, ingrained in us. But also um, as a DEI practitioner, I would just say being intentional about data-driven decision-making and also training us on how to navigate these difficult dialogues around, you know, issues that are prominent to D, uh, DEI, but specifically DEI in the context of higher ed. I would always say that, um, you know, the cohort model was the best and most challenging part of the experience for me mm -hmm. because it was really hard. I think that this program is social justice oriented through and through. But when you have to reckon, reckon with that and reflect and, you know, lean and be vulnerable, but also intentional with your professional pursuits, it, it really um, makes for sometimes a challenging environment to navigate. And so I think because of that, I've seen a lot of um I've seen a lot of um, success in my current career, especially as a perceived to be young professional um, with knowing how to like navigate those challenges and being intentional about the bigger, the bigger scope that's at play. So, yeah. I, I definitely echo that. And it certainly goes beyond, you know, our, our work in higher ed too. Um, I became, became a very different person after, after our grad program. Um, and, and I just have a, a more of appreciation for, you know, the complexities in, in society uh, and handling difficult conversations, not only with my colleagues, but uh, friends and family from home as well. So just beyond higher ed, uh, those, those skills were uh, and experiences were really important. Um, I'd also just throw in communication, right? Uh, we have to give a lot of presentations, write a lot of papers, um, and it seems tedious. But um, now, in in my role, um, I, I come up with a lot of ideas. You know, uh, ideating programs, um, looking through data, um, doing doing assessments, and to be able to. Um, communicate my ideas is really, really important. That might actually be at a presentation with my colleagues, or it might be in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, um, or it might be some a written memo, right? Um, but it becomes really important if you want to do um, some of the things that you're interested in, some of the things that you believe will result uh, um, in, in success for students, if you're working directly with them, comes with being able to convey your ideas. Um, and so the communication piece was really important than just... Um, Shout out to the uh, assessment course, which I think most people don't like, but I really enjoyed. And that gave me some of the uh, good technical skills as far as assessment and surveying, um, working with data, which I think in most roles, data is going to be very important and it's constantly becoming more and more important. And so some of those technical skills uh, were also great going into uh, my job. Uh, I will follow up and piggyback off of what Douglas has said, those technical skills. Again, a big part of my role is data and researching, uh, making sure that the data is coherent. Again, with what AC said, like making sure that we're as evidence-based and evidence-driven as possible. Um, because when you're working in a sector like probation or court, you need to make sure that things are working and that people are not harmed because of some like something that is an easy fix in terms of a policy or a procedure, right? And so... I, I mean, I can remember so many classes, um, specifically I'll say with um, Haley Weddle and um, Eleanor Anderson during my time at Pitt was really learning how to take a pen to paper and really dive into policy and really read it and make sure you're understanding it, um, which I've done already. And I found like a contradicting paragraph, right? That was basically gonna end up harming somebody later down the road. And I took it to my boss and I was like, hey, I know you didn't send this out yet, but if we could revise this, I think it would be helpful because of A, B, C, D reasons. And she said, Great, wonderful. Thanks for catching that because that could have been a big error on our part. And I said, exactly. So again, those hard and soft skills of just communication, data analysis, um, making sure that you're reaching people where they are is another big part of my job. Um, 
A lot of people, I'm I'm one of the youngest on staff. I'm one of two still in their 20s. And so when I'm talking to my staff who's a little older, they're not familiar with diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? That's a big part of my job um, and trying to reach them where they're at and also provide some new thoughts, some new um, understandings of uh, the language and what it means for our jobs. Absolutely. Um, we got another question. Um, hello, I want to know what are some of the key skills and experiences in the field of higher education and education policy that you think are critical for future career development? One thing I will absolutely say is, especially if um, your goal is to work in a very student um, focused position, student centered position, and you're interacting daily. One thing that I had wished I had taken um, a greater opportunity to read about while I was in grad school and have greater appreciation is for, um, you know, we're not a counseling based program, but some of like those soft skills in terms of like navigating that. I had had um, a, a, a pretty intense student crisis happen my first semester here. And um, I had been very like, I was in a higher ed management program, like I'm very administratively driven, like that is where my strength is. And um, I needed to take some time that first semester to do some additional research and reading and just think about the fact that I, you know, even having come from being supervised the exact same size RA population I was while I was a grad student, being able to think of it in like a different way in a more personal way was um, honestly a skill that I in grad school, I was just like, oh, like, this is where I'm good at. And this is where I'm comfortable and realizing that um, being very student focused, I needed to take in some of that a little bit more. Um, I definitely think AC had brought up like doing the job talk in um, class. Like, I definitely think that as a part of the capstone is just incredibly helpful it is absolutely a skill that is very applicable to what you're doing. Um, and additionally, I remember having to put together like a programming proposal. Um, and that is something I very much continue to rely on just opportunities that um, I didn't think about as much in grad school, but I have opportunities on the job when it's a, you know, if it's a small opportunity for a grant or for retention funding, like even within the college I'm at, um, just to have been able to practice that and do those things are absolutely like very tangible ways that um, I was able to say grad school helped with this and or um, here are the ways I can like dig deeper into the education that I received. Any other thoughts? All right. Um, what was your experience as a master's student in the school of ed at Pitt? At Pitt? I'll just go ahead and say it was busy. Um, yeah, uh, it, a very broad question, but I, I, I will say I was I was one of those students that you know. Um, I, I uh, had my social work job, I bartended, um, I had my internship at RMU for residence life. And so, um, but I also, I also had a social life and I, you know, had a lot of fun with, with uh, some of my classmates and became really good friends with them. So um, I would describe it as a whirlwind, uh, a lot of nights staying up writing papers, uh, a very tired time in my life, but again, uh, fun, worth the experience. Um, gained gained a lot from it but i don't i don't know if i could go back and do it again i'm i'm kind of lazy now uh so uh but but yeah it was it was it was a good experience but de just definitely very busy i would say in contrast to douglas i was very uh, low key is what I'll call it. It was very chill for me in grad school. And I think that's because coming out of undergrad, I was so busy. I had so many, you know, leadership positions and student roles and I was volunteering and doing other things. Um, and then of course, 2020, and I think for most of us, I think we can say that the mental health behind that um, definitely played a role to some extent and it showed up in its different ways. Right. And for me, I think it showed up as this is actually a really good time to learn how to 
relax and focus on work primarily and focus on school. Um, and it was a really difficult transition for me to do that because it felt like I was being lazy. And thankfully, again, I had so many faculty members um, to talk to about this as it related to school because it felt like I wasn't doing enough, right? And that was really, really difficult for me. But thankfully, my advisor was like, Cheney, this is not anything new that I've seen from students um, and you deserve to just rest and chill out and focus mainly on school. So that's what I did. Um, and again, I think the research helped me a lot, but I, I think I wasn't as busy as I was. And I'm very thankful for that. It helped me pour in, I think a little bit more to my work um, for myself. Yeah, I, I would say that um, it came with a lot of autonomy, which was a little bit surprising. Um, and it really helped me kind of see myself as like this independent scholar. And we just had, you know, uh, discussions with our peers about the coursework to help elevate our research agendas or our experiences with um, certain, you know, research topics and things of that sort. So I really appreciated that. Um, as a transplant, I will say and be honest that sometimes it, it, it was lonely, depending on, you know, your assistantship and things of that nature. And so I encourage all the people who would be um, transitioning a pit to get involved and invested, not only with the um, opportunities that the university, you know, um, provides for you, but other um, avenues as well. I joined the fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, um, the alumni chapter throughout my time as a, a master's student, which was definitely exciting and helped um, keep me busy. Um, and last but not least, I would just say my experience was um, from like a professional, professional, right? And that's the part to Channing's point earlier, it was really hard, you know, trying to, you know, sometimes articulate the experiences that I gained because my second year I did my GA ship under the vice provost and dean of students in collaboration with the, it's now the OI Office of Inclusion and Belonging, but it used to be the CCLD. And I felt like a member of their professional staff. You know, I was a part of their leadership team meetings and they regarded me as a, you know, a professional and, you know, really valued the ways in which I contributed. And that just set me up on a path, um, you know, sometimes when I chat with peers about their master's experience and programs, they they were a little bit more rigid. And so I really appreciate the flexibility in the, the ways that the school education ignites learning. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 100% retweet to everything AC said, because I, I, I really appreciate it. Like, I felt like a scholar. I felt very autonomous in being able to do that. Um, I think Pitt, Pittsburgh is a great city for young professionals. Um, I moved out there with my now fiance, and he, um, he works in the law sector, but um, just the opportunities for us both, like, it was, it was a really, I loved my time out there, and I, um, part of the reason for that is my time both in the program and in terms of being able to connect with my cohort mates um, for class projects, for studying outside the classroom, just for writing papers to all those things. It was very collaborative. We spent a lot of time in class talking and doing discussion, but I had, to, you know, we had to do a lot of class projects. We talked a lot about, um, you know, working alongside people with a little bit different styles, different, you know, priorities, like really knowing what your philosophy is in relation to somebody else. Um, and so a lot of time spent, you know, getting to work with others um, was very, was really great. And I, I, like AC, I really appreciate that you said that autonomous work, because I really do feel like in grad school and through the School of Pitt was how I found what my work study, my work style is, what works for me. Um, but I was able to learn so much from others that I definitely incorporate into like my student worker management and like working alongside my colleagues. So. Um, collaboration and just like those moments um even now when I reach out for professional help like it is the people that were in my cohort that I went to grad school with that are um the ones I'm usually reaching out to even opposed to like other colleagues that might have left my place because honestly they have a much they have, just have a wealth of knowledge that um you know I I work at a liberal arts college I love liberal arts learning but um I need to hear from other folks sometimes for sure um, and thank you so much for your nice comment, Latoya. That was very nice in the chat section. <laughs> All right, we got another question and maybe we'll probably wrap up after this one, maybe. Um, do you feel it was affordable to live in Pittsburgh during your time in your master's program? And did you receive financial assistance for tuition or housing and assistantship? 
So for me, it was very affordable because again, I graduated in 2020 from undergrad. I went right back home, right? I was living with my parents. Um, so, and I was, and I'm very thankful that I was able to, not everyone can for various reasons, right? Um, so in that regard, it was affordable for me. Even now, um, living on my own, it's still pretty affordable for me, thankfully. I do know that Pittsburgh's ranked in the affordability. I think the top 10 of the country at least. Um, so I think that that's a great thing. I did get help with, I forget the name of it now, but that COVID relief, essentially, um, that helped me pay for my books out of pocket, um, a lot of my parking. Um, thankfully, Pitt has really good student parking, um, but you know, to pay for that parking fast outright, that's what helped, right? Um, so I would say it is affordable um, simply because there are so many scholarships um, and internships available um, at Pitt and also around the city of Pittsburgh because it's connected to the University of Pittsburgh. For um, my, for me, and this was, I had entered the program in 2018. Um, like I said, my partner and I had moved out there together. We were living in the Greenfield neighborhood, which was very affordable um, for the two of us as new professionals, um, both right out of undergrad. Um, and so that, you know, um, transparently, like I've lived on campus actually ever since. And so I paid more out of pocket expenses then. Um, and I was actually like, you know, I, I took advantage of resources that Pig gave to make that easier. I'd actually sat down, um, with a free financial advisor once, but I was just really trying to budget for the two of us that first year. Um, and ever since then, like, honestly, things had gotten themselves worked out in pretty, um, pretty good ways. I mean, I went to Pitt because it was affordable for me. It was something that I was able to make happen, which was really important. I didn't want to, um, I had loans from undergrad. And I didn't want to leave with more than I thought, um, but honestly, like should have been worth it. And, um, so Pitt as a young city to get situ, as a young person in a city to get situated was great. Um, my first year, my assistantship was through Carnegie Mellon. And so like that, that was all I really had and used. And then my second year was when I transitioned into residence life. And so I moved on to Pitt's campus. Um, I had received a stipend through that, but that um, I'm actually like, I'm still very grateful to this day. I had that experience my first year in Pitt because um, it's something just when I talk to young people or I actually have an RA who's going to Pitt for um, dentistry and she's so like, I'm so thrilled for her, but I'm really like, when I talk to her, I'm like, Diana, like, you're going to thrive because Pittsburgh makes it possible for young people to thrive and Pitt makes it possible. But Pittsburgh is like a really great city um, to get situated, to find affordability, um, but to get connected to a lot of places that, um, you know, within Pennsylvania, within like, I think that general Midwest region, like Pittsburgh really is a hub for a lot of that and um, is really great in that way. I also will share like I we only had one car between between the two of us. I took public transportation my entire time in Pittsburgh. I do not drive. Um, and it was honestly very, pretty seamless. So I really appreciated that. Absolutely. Jumping in, um, putting a spin on things again, I want to acknowledge that um, affordability is obviously subjective. And so everybody's, you know, experience is a little bit different. But as a um, single young professional as well, I found it to be really affordable. Um, to I want to add to Rose's point, the parking slash transportation piece was a part that I had to eliminate. So I initially brought my car with me, but the whole parking, you know, prices, as well as the wait list and all of that stuff. I just swiped left and got rid of my car. And once I did that, it just really um, made things easy to navigate for me financially. And then the other piece that I just really wanted to highlight is that there are a plethora of resources um, between um, the actual School of Education, but also CGSE, um, like for conference funding and, you know, additional things of that sort. I want to say the university also has an emergency fund. Don't quote me on that, but I'm almost sure that they do as well in case things come up, hardships come up. Um, but generally speaking, it was really easy to navigate. And then my asterisk to this answer is um, especially as a transplant with so many, um, you know, universities neighboring each other. I always tell people, I think that the housing in Pittsburgh is like the Hunger Games. So first things first, there are a lot of slumlords out there and they go so fast. And so I would just say that's where I experienced the the most um, just challenges with navigating. It's like once I found a place, I just stick with that same landlord and just kind of moved around. But housing goes really fast. And so if you're thinking about coming to campus, you know, or looking for roommates and things, just look at all the resources. And Facebook has a lot of those. And then finishing off, I lied, this is going to be the last question. 
Um, if there was one piece of advice you would share with those in the higher education program for those interested, what would it be and why? Mine's going to be just do it. I waited a little longer than I anticipated, and I wish I would have done it a couple years ago. I just think it's really rewarding and really beneficial, and now I'm just itching to go to the next level and possibly get my EDD. So it just kind of, I think someone said it, but like it really ignites your passion in the field. My advice um, would be not to ha not to be afraid to use your networks and connections. Um, you know, even on this call alone, like the reason that people are here willing to talk and speak is because we did have positive experiences with that. Um, and the, you know, as I put it, right, the ability to continue to rely on people that I had classes with now four or five years ago and still say that I trust you as a resource. I know our experience that we've been through, like building those networks and connections, not losing them, making sure you're actually investing in them, reaching out to people, checking in on them. Um, but that was something that was super emphasized in the program and is something that um, I continue to do really well in some regards. I don't do as well about in some regards, but it's something that I'm always telling myself, like, um, especially with input, keeping those connections fruitful. Um, people really do want to pay it forward, want to get you connected to opportunities. And also, even once you're in the field, right, like the I got my position now they're a small connection that I had way back before I had ever started my grad program, but I was able to take everything I learned from pay and make it applicable here. So um, not hesitating to reach out to people and check in because you never know what connections people have. You never know who knows what. And like I said earlier, student affairs is pretty small. And so somebody probably knows somebody who can help you out um, or at least give you insight for what you want, need to know. I'm a big believer that the only way to make this field better is to be transparent about both the successes, but also the many challenges that happen. I love student affairs, but if I said that everything was great all the time, like that just wouldn't be the truth. And so I really want to help um, just be open and transparent for people. And so if they reach out, give them the same respect and honesty I would want somebody to give me. Uh, I think my piece of advice is don't be afraid to pivot. I think I was really hung up on the fact that, oh, I, I'm not in the field of education policy. What is that going to look like for me? And here I am still using every skill that I've ever learned in the classroom from my advisor who's actually on the call. Um, hi, Dr. Porter. Um, <laughs> uh, every bit of skill that I got from any other faculty member from the peers that I still talk to almost every day. Um, do not be afraid to pivot and just lean into it. Everything is a learning experience um, and keep going. Yeah, all, all great so far, Rosie actually stole mine, which was networking. Um, very important, but I'll, I'll, I'll pivot a little bit too and just say, uh, really try to think about what your niche is, um, what skills and experiences you have that set you apart from everybody else. Um, because coming into this role, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm very passionate about um, data uh, and assessment. And it's something that I pushed and wasn't necessarily a part of my role uh, when I got here, but um, I did it so much and I pushed for it so much that I started uh, to move into more of those roles. Um, and it also opened me up to opportunities to present at conferences. Um, you know, it was innovative. It was a little bit different than, you know, what the rest of the career counselors were doing. So, um, yeah, just trying to find that niche for yourself um, can help you really stand out, um, can help you uh, really move forward in your career as well. For me, it boils down to three C's. So the first one is being genuinely curious will, you know, take you my, like all over the place. Um, the second piece is getting connected, as my colleagues have already said, but getting connected to the city of Pittsburgh as well is important. And last but not least, being open to change. Um, I think that those things are really those three things will set you up for success. I love that. Thank you all so, so much today for helping us out with this panel. All of you guys spoke great words of wisdom and answered our um, guest questions that they had here. Thank you, Marcy, for moderating this event today.
Um, if anybody has any questions, I actually meant to put this in the chat already, but I'm going to put it right now. If you guys have any questions in regards to admissions and you're looking for some more information on what you can be able to do about admissions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, another thing is too, if you guys are just looking for some more information about um, what's going on at the school or having some student experience, I'm pretty sure most of our panelists would be okay with you talking to them about their experience, but even more so we have students too who are actively in the program as well. So we're always open to those experiences. You guys were honest with us today, which we 100% appreciate. We wanna make sure that we have a genuine experience that's offered for all of our guests today. So thank you for that. And thank you for taking the time to talk about this. Thank you guys all for joining us. And as always, we are always here to help. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Latoya. Absolutely. That's it. <laughs>